500 times. Obviously, we're in here. And we're through a major part of it already. We've already talked about all the basal lineages and really all the way up to the bony fish. This is a mess, right? This is the old system. This word we're not using anymore. This word we're not using anymore. But this word we are. That's, those were the three that I was just asking you about, right? If you look on that new phylogeny, you don't see the word sarcophagia. You don't see the word agnathan. And we talked a little bit about this problem of birds being a group within reptiles. And you're going to see that in just a moment here. Okay, so what would you call everything in the red box there? What word would you use to call those? Fish. Right? Those are fish. What does that mean? The word fish is not meaningful. Not from a biological point of view, right? I mean, it does describe something. It describes a body plan, right? You have a streamlined body, you have fins, you live in the water, you're a fish, right? But by that definition, a whale's a fish. A dolphin's a fish in real life, right? So the word fish can be used to describe a body plan, but it doesn't describe a natural group of organisms. It's a polyphyletic group, or at best, a paraphyletic group. If it's paraphyletic, though, how do you make it monophyletic? You have to add these guys in. And then the word fish sort of loses its meaning, right? You all thought from when you were kids that dolphins and whales are not fish. Well, guess what? They are. So are deer. So are cows. So are dogs. So is you. So are birds, right? In order to have the word fish be mean from, from a biological point of view, all of these things have to be fish. It's kind of a problem, right? That's probably not what you think of when you think of a fish, right? You probably wouldn't look at a little frog and go, oh, what a cute little fish, right? What could you say about all fish, though? Are they all napatitos? Are they all cranes? Are they all vertebrates? Or is there really not even anything that fish all share? All of those things that we were just calling fish, do they all fit into at least one of those groups? Or are they so completely unrelated to one another that they don't even fit all into one group? I notice I'm putting the word fish in quotation marks because I'm trying to indicate that it's not monophyletic. Because the traits that we associate with fish are likely to be ancestral traits, right? For that entire group, and that's that's why they're not monophyletic. The things that you you are defining as fish, you're defining them based on characteristics that are simply geometric. And you all get that a group defined on simplicity more you can't be it, right? You can only use derived characters to define groups. How about it? Do we have two more? Think about it. Do all fish have jaws? Do all fish have heads? Do all fish have vertebral columns? Or not, none of them? OK, are we all there? Is there one more? I'm going to end it. There we go. See, they're all over there. Do, do all fish have jaws? Do all fish have vertebral columns? No. no. What's an example of a fish that doesn't have a vertebral column? Fish. But do all fish have a head? They do, right? What fish doesn't have a head? That'd be kind of a creepy fish, wouldn't it? <laughs> they all have a head, right? All chordates don't have heads, like your chordates, cephalic chordates don't have heads. All the things we're calling fish. Yeah. Okay, so I already showed you these. These are who's? So gray fin, bony fish. So now we're going to focus on the low fin, bony fish. Anybody know what this animal's called? It's called a coelacanth. Have you heard of that? And you'll notice that it has what almost look like little legs. There actually are skeletal elements that extend into these little lobes, right? So it has a few of the little rays too, but it actually has major parts of its skeleton that extend outside of the body wall. The other fish didn't have anything like that, right? These coelacanths were known for a very long time from fossils. You can find fossils that are a few hundred million years old that look almost exactly like this, right? So that's why they call this sometimes a living fossil. People thought that this type of body form was completely extinct, and then some fishermen in the Indian Ocean pulled one up, right? And now they find them from time to time. They're still not super common, but um, they're alive in the world today. And yet, this particular body form you can find in fossils that are very, very old. Um, these would have been put together with lungfish in this group of sarcopterygians. It ends up that that's not monophyletic if you do 
do it that way. So they're now putting their own group called actinism. So these are chordates. They have a head. They have a vertical column. They're nappa stones. They have jaws. And they have an ossified skeleton in the swim bladder. They also have skeletal elements that extend beyond the body wall into their appendages. And then there are coelacanths so within this group of actinisms. The other group of lobed fin fish, right, which of course is not monophyletic if you only count coelacanths and lungfish together, would be these lungfish. They also have skeletal elements that extend into these little things that almost look like little legs, right? Um, and they have all those characters I just said that the, the coelacanth has as well, right? The idea is that these are potentially the early precursors to land dwelling vertebrates, the tetra right, with these appendages, all of the land-dwelling vertebrates. Obviously, if you look like a fish and you're trying to live on land, that's not going to work too well, right? You have to look something more like a tetrapod, something that has legs that can actually walk around. Um, these are thought to be sort of a body form that would lead, that would be a precursor to terrestrial vertebrates, the tetrapods. This is one of the great mysteries in biology. Remember I said that there's this mystery of where did seed plants come from, where did flowering plants come from, where did tetrapods come from. I mentioned Neil Schumann at the beginning with that book, that Your Inner Fish, you know what I, I said, he taught medical classes at the University of Chicago. And he actually is a, a biologist who studies early tetrapod evolution. He's found some really important fossils in the Arctic that are considered to be very informative with respect to how early tetrapods might have evolved. I think in Acanthus stega, and it's an early fossil that they found that sort of gives you some idea as to what you might look like if you were a very, very early tetrapod. You'll notice on top of having limb bones that extend beyond the body wall into the appendages, and that really start to look very much like modern tetrapod limb bones, right? Where you can imagine this is a, you know, I mean, here it has a pectoral girdle with maybe sort of almost like a little scapula you could imagine. And here you have the humerus and the radius and colon, these little things that look like carpals and phalanges. And back here you have something that looks very much like a pelvis with, uh, you know, femur and a, maybe a tibia and a fibula and little tarsal bones and stuff like that. It starts to look very, very much like some kind of a, a, a real tetrapod. You also will notice that the head does not look like a fish head, really, right? Well, why does it not look like a fish's head? Because you'll notice rather than being laterally flattened, it's dorsoventrally flattened. The eyes are on the top, they're not on the sides. So this starts to really look like, like a uh, sort of a tetrapod fossil. That, that characteristic of having the head dorsoventrally flattened rather than laterally flattened is considered sort of a very good hallmark that you have something that's approaching what we think of as being a modern tetrapod. Uh, and you also have, which is sort of shown here, you have this little bit of a neck, right? Fish don't really have a neck. So I'm sure you, that's a, a feature that you associate more with this type of a head and with this type of tetrapod overall anatomy. So this is, a, I think this came right out of the Campbell. This shows you up here, you know, the ray fin fish, the actinopterygians. There it shows the coelacanths and the lungfish. Then it has all these other things in here, right? And then down here we have amphibians and then the amniotes. Amniotes are going to be reptiles, birds, and mammals. Uh, and the reason I show this tree is because there's some interesting things you can get from this tree. Do you know, do you know why these little white lines are, are so short right here? Why is that? Because they're extinct, right? So you notice things like lungfish. We have lungfish in the world today. That's why they come up here. Coelacanths, that would have been a short little line here until they found some, and then they had to make the line go all the way to here because the coelacanths are still alive in the world today. And obviously we have modern amphibians, and there's lots of modern amniotes here. But all of these other things are only known from fossils. So clearly they're not using DNA data here in order to reconstruct phylogeny. They're using the whole morphological data matrix, kind of like what you did with your monkeys, right, where you were coding all these different characters. They code them based largely on skeletal characters, because they don't have soft tissue for the most most part, and then they run a phylogenetic analysis, and this is kind of what they come up with. Um, there's something interesting for you to see here. This is the first tree I've shown you that has fossil taxa. And you might have noticed, what was I saying that, that sort of was the sister group to tetrapods? We were saying it was lungfish, right? If you look at that, that other tree, right? Didn't we have lungfish as the sister group to tetrapods? Yeah, no, maybe. You all remember? And that other tree that comes down like, how does it come down? Can I do it right? Right, doesn't it come down like this? Down like this? And then don't we have like tetrapods here and lungfish are here? They're the sister. Lungfish are the sister group to tetrapods. That's the way it looks in that tree I keep showing you, doesn't it? Can I go back to that tree easily? Probably not. I'm going to have questions in there and everything. 
So are lungfish the sister group to tetrapods here? No, not really, right? I mean, really, you'd guess this little brutathon or whatever this thing's called would be maybe the sister group to the tetrapods, right? It doesn't look like it could be lungfish. Lungfish are way far back. So that's kind of maybe slightly problematic. Who's right there? Is this tree right or is the other tree right? How, how about the fact that tetrapods themselves, who are tetrapods again? Amphibians and amniotes. Do you see a problem with tetrapods in this tree? But what if you didn't know this little guy existed? Then would it look like this was monophyletic? Okay, so here's the big dirty secret that I've avoided telling you for the last three months. There really is no such thing as monophyletic. After spending the whole semester telling you this is a good group, this is not a good group, and getting you all fixated on that, it's all kind of a lie. So I'm glad you learned it all, but in reality, there really is no such thing as monophyletic, and that's because all of the trees that I've shown you have only extant taxa on them. We've been ignoring everything that's extinct, largely because we don't even know about it. You realize, like, 99.9% .9 of all the species that have ever lived are gone, right? And up until now, all we've been talking about are just things that are in the world today. You're missing 99 plus percent of all the biological diversity. In everything we've looked at, you're missing a huge, vast majority. So there really is no such thing as monophyly. You're talking only about modern groups. If you're talking about only modern groups, then tetrapods are monophyletic, but they're really not. Right? Because in all likelihood, there's some fossil or something that's missing that really should be included in the group that you're not including because probably you don't even know it exists. How jaded are you? Jaded? I've done this on the exam where I showed this tree and I asked these questions, basically. And basically, what I want you to say this is the only tree I've shown you that has fossil tax. As soon as you start considering things that are extinct, the picture changes dramatically. Right. Even what you, a group that you would refer to as being monophyletic is no longer monophyletic. What you refer to as being the sister group to some other group really isn't. Right? This is part of the trouble with the phylogeny. If you're trying to reconstruct evolutionary history using less than 1% of the diversity that gave rise to it. Yeah. Okay, so which one of the following is an actinopterygian fish? That should be easy, right? Actinopterygian means what? Bony, ray fin, right? So somebody who does not have skeletal elements that extend beyond the body wall, but that does have an ossified skeleton and a swim bladder. In other words, you're not going to want to pick a fish that's a cartilaginous fish. Uh -huh. also have a symmetrical <laughs> causal. It's like you have to do it really quick. Shark is a cartilaginous fish, right? Lampreys are jawless fish. They don't have ossified skeletons. The coelacanth is a lobe fish, so only an eel would be a ray fin fish. Okay, so here we go. Buckle your seatbelts. 20 minutes of tetrapods. So we'll start with amphibians, right? Amphibia means what? Amphi or amphi means what? Both. Both lives, or two lives, right? Because they have an aquatic portion to their life history and a terrestrial portion of their life history. Except for a group called Sicilians that I'll show you in a second, they have external fertilization. What does that mean? They lay, well, yeah, but like a chicken lays eggs too, and yet it has internal fertilization. What is it? It releases not only the egg, but it also releases the sperm, right? So when chickens, when the sperm fuses with the egg in a chicken, it's happening inside the female chicken's body, right? But if you have external fertilization, it means the female produces eggs and spits them out, and the male produces sperm and spits it out, and then the sperm and the eggs meet out there somewhere, outside of the female's body. This means that you must be doing this where? In the water. In the water, right? Because we're right back to sperm don't fly, right? So 
if you're going to be doing this, if you're going to be letting sperm go into the environment, you better be in water, right? Does this remind you of anybody? Who does this remind you of? When was the last time I told you sperm don't fly? Oh my God, you've already forgotten it. Because it was a whole month ago. How about, how about non seed plants, right? Sperms, mosses, liverworts, they all let sperm go, right? This is very much kind of like that. These guys are all letting sperm go. So they're tied to water for reproduction. If you look at fish eggs, for example, fish eggs basically, uh, frog eggs, if you look at frog eggs, they basically look like fish eggs. They have to be in water. If you take frog eggs out of water, they dry up. They're not like chicken eggs that can sit on land and hatch someday, right? They have to be in water. So these guys very much have their reproductive cycle tied to water. They're very much in that way, kind of like non seed plants. You'll see the group amniotes are going to be the fully terrestrial tetrapods. Those are the ones we're going to kind of say are analogous to seed plants. And a large part of what they've done is they've figured out how to free their life history from the need for water. You'll notice that they have internal fertilization. The male actually puts sperm inside the female's body, and they all put their eggs on land. Even amniotes that live in the water their whole life, like sea snakes, sea turtles. Sea turtles don't lay their eggs in the water. They come onto land, right? Plasma. How about what? Plasma. And platypus would lay their eggs on land, too. And platypus is a mammal, of course, but it's an amniote that lays eggs. Okay, so these guys are all ectothermic. Now, there's variations on this, but we're going to kind of say, how would you say ectothermic? I'll cringe a little bit. Cold-blooded. Cold Basically means they do not spend a lot of energy regulating a constant internal body temperature the way mammals and birds do, which are endothermic, right? And then we come to this business of a heart, and I realize I should have a slide for this, but let's just do it real fast. I figure you guys are all, like, most of you want to go into medicine. So you all know basic parts of a heart and circulation, right? Or maybe not. Come on, I said he mushrooms, so I don't know. So let, let's kind of look at the heart. So we'll start, you realize that a vertebrate can have either a two-chambered, three-chambered, or four-chambered heart. And here's where we're really talking about like real hearts with chambers. So the little things we were talking about, like in a cricket, that, like that little dorsal blood vessel that kind of pulses a little bit in order to move blood through the hemoseal, that's not really a heart heart, not like the type of heart we're going to talk about now. The little pumps on a earthworm, they call them, it says that they have five little hearts, but they're not hearts with chambers, the way that we think of them in, in vertebrate animals. But when we think of vertebrate animal parts, we start with two, so let's look at two, because that's the simplest one. You all know this or no? I'm going to do it really fast. You realize up in the lab, we've got a whole bunch of heart models, so you can sit up there and study them to your heart's content. You kind of need to know this, but you'll figure it out. It's in the lab. Okay, so what do we call a blood vessel that brings blood towards the heart? Uh, towards the heart. Vein. Okay, what do we call a blood vessel that takes blood away from the heart? Artery. And do you know what we call a chamber that receives blood? The first chamber that the blood goes into? It's called an atrium, right? And then the second chamber is called a ventricle, right? So, and the blood's moving through this way, right? So it's kind of like ba, 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 ba. Vein, atrium, ventricle, artery, vein, atrium, ventricle, artery, vein, atrium, ventricle, artery, right? And if this was a fish, all fish have something like this, a two-chambered heart. From here, it would go to the gills, and that's where it brings the blood into very close contact with the water, right? Oxygen concentration is relatively high in the water than it is in the blood after the blood's passed through the body, right? And so oxygen diffuses into the blood. Carbon dioxide concentrations are relatively high in the blood relative to the water because the blood's moved through the body, picking up carbon dioxide from all the cells as a waste product. So carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood into the water. And then the blood has to travel all the way through the body and all the way back up to the heart, right? So you've got little arterioles and everything down here and little venules here, capillaries in the middle. and Single pass heart, right? Vein, atrium, ventricle, artery, all the way through the gills, all the way through the body, all the way back to the heart again, right? Single pass, right? There's no terrestrial animal that can work with a heart like this. Because for whatever reason, this does not work when you're dealing with like respiring through your skin the way that a frog does or using lungs. It just doesn't fly. All animals that are on land have to have a double pass heart. There has to be a way to get the blood to go through the heart twice so that the blood gets a push to the lungs, push to the body, push to the lungs, push to the body, not one push trying to get it all the way to go. So the way that the more simple vertebrate animals do it is with a three-chambered heart. So how do you think that would work? You're going to have two atria, right? 
and one ventricle. So here's the ventricle, and then if you think this is the heart here, right? This is the right atrium, this is the left atrium, right? So oxygen poor blood that's coming from the body enters on the right side, coming in in is that going to be a vein, like the vena cava or something, right? It goes right atrium, ventricle, pushed to what? The lungs or whatever. What's this going to be that's carrying blood out to the lungs? This is a artery. It's, by definition, it's an artery because it is leaving the heart. But is it oxygen rich or oxygen poor? It hasn't been in the lung yet. It's oxygen poor. It's a pulmonary artery. That was a Jeopardy question one time. What's the only oxygen poor artery in the body? pulmonary artery, right? It's on its way to the lungs. It doesn't matter. A lot of people think that an artery is automatically oxygen rich and a vein is automatically oxygen poor, and that's generally true, but it's not true here. The definition of the word artery is it's a blood vessel that's carrying blood away from the heart. In this case, this particular blood vessel is carrying blood away from the heart, but it's oxygen poor blood because it hasn't been to the lungs yet. So we're going to go to the lungs, we're going to get oxygen, right? And then we're going to come back on the left side. Is this a vein or an artery? going towards the heart, right? So it's got to be a vein. It's a pulmonary vein. And guess what? That's going to be the only what? Oxygen-rich vein, because it just was in the lungs, right? And then from that vein, we're going to come into the left atrium, then into the ventricle, and then we're going to push to the body. This is going to be a what? Artery, the biggest artery in the body, which is what? The aorta, right? So this is the aorta. And we're going to go down here to the body. And we're going to drop off all our oxygen, pick up all our carbon dioxide, and then make our way back to the heart in a vein. And a bunch of little venules, and eventually back to the vein, vein and cava, whatever. Yeah? So do you see how there's a double pass here? It's vein, right atrium, ventricle, pushed to the lungs, right? In an artery. Then vein, left atrium, ventricle, pushed to the body, right? Vein, right atrium, ventricle, pushed to the lungs in a pulmonary artery, bring the blood back in a pulmonary vein. Left atrium ventricle, push to the body. Yeah, so push to the lungs, push to the body, push to the lungs, push to the body, right? No pushing one time and expect it to go all the way through the lungs and all the way back to the body. That doesn't work. There's no animal that uses lungs that's respiring on land. It's facilitating gas exchange between air and blood. They use a two-chambered heart. That's a fish type thing. Although you'll notice a baby frog has two chambers. So here you think of like a tadpole going to a frog, and you think, oh, well, you know, it kind of absorbs the tail and and then it sort of like grows little legs, and that's the end. Well, it's actually doing a complete rearrangement of its internal anatomy, too, going from a two-chambered to a three-chambered heart to a complete change of vascularization. It really goes through a radical metamorphosis as you go from a juvenile amphibian to an adult. Yeah. So, anybody see a problem with this? Because, of course, you don't have a three-chambered heart, right? You know who else has these besides adult frogs and salamanders? How about, like, snakes? They all have three, right? But birds and mammals and crocodiles, interestingly enough, have four. Why, why would you want four? Where do you think the fourth one comes? Any idea? Anybody see a problem here? No? How about this? We're bringing oxygen poor blood in on this side, right? And we're bringing oxygen rich blood in right here. And we've only got one ventricle. So the oxygen poor blood and the oxygen rich blood mixing in that ventricle. That's not good. Because that means half the blood you're sending to the lungs was just there. And half the blood you're sending out to the body hasn't been in the lungs yet. You're mixing oxygen poor and oxygen rich blood because you only have one ventricle. So what do you think mammals and birds and crocodiles do? There's a septum right here that divides this so that you have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. All of the oxygen poor blood stays entirely on the right side of your heart. All of the oxygen rich blood stays entirely on the left side of your heart. There's no mixing in the ventricle. So not only do you have a double pass heart, you have a double pass heart where the two different bloods don't mix. Yeah? Okay. Interestingly, you'll notice we're going to transition into land here. And notice we're doing it from fresh water. Right? Same thing for plants. Plants, the closest relatives are actually the carified algae, which are fresh water. The invasions of, of terrestrial environments for both vertebrate animals and for plants are coming from fresh water, interestingly, not from marine. So here's a little baby frog, slightly more mature frog, right? Here's a mommy and daddy frog. You see all their eggs out here in the water. And it looks like the daddy frog is 
mating with the mommy frog, but he's not. This is a, it's called anthus plexus or something like that, where they actually, the male comes up behind her, he's squeezing the eggs out of her, and as he squeezes the eggs out of her, he's putting sperm in the water behind it. But the fusion of the sperm and the eggs is occurring in the water, it's not occurring inside of her, so this is external. So, notice how we're linking together all these names. This would have been a phylum, right? And amphibia would have been a class. What all those others are, I don't even know. But these are in the subphylum, if you want to say craniata, the sub subphylum vertebrata, right? You're getting familiar with all of these groups. Clearly, they have jaws, they have an ossified skeleton, they have skeletal elements that extend beyond the body wall. So, these guys are all of a sudden lobed fins. They're tetrapods in the sense that they have an ectogermal and pelvic girdle and four, four limbs. If amphibia was a class, then we could define it into orders. And the three orders here are anura, apoda, and urodella. Here's the word that I was going with, right? So anura means what? No tail, right? Is that what we decided? Did we decide uro means tail? Urodella probably means like with the tail. That's going to be salamanders and noops. These are toads and frogs, obviously. And Sicilians lack legs completely. It's almost like a little worm or something. And these are apoda, which means without legs, right? So if I said on the exam, I said a neuro, you'd all say what? As a name. If I give you that name, is there a picture in your head? Right, you'd say Kermit or something. Name a frog. So how about this? Those little Cecilias I just showed you, the little apoda without legs? Snakes don't have legs either. Right? So what could you say about leglessness for Sicilians and snakes? Does it likely represent a symplesiomorphic trait, a homologous trait, a convergent trait, or a synapomorphic trait? Why is it, what's the, what's the nature of the leglessness that you find in those two groups? If I asked you who's a Sicilian's closest relative, you'd say something like what? Frog or salamander. How about what's a snake's closest relative? How about like a lizard? Right? So the reality is the closest relatives of these two legless groups have legs. Right? They're not each other's closest relatives. This is getting you to the animal. They're not each other's closest relatives, right? You couldn't make a a group of Sicilians plus snakes and expect that to be monophyletic. So what does that tell you about the character leglessness? About how it evolved? Okay, are we all there? 15? It's likely converging, right? It's likely each group lost their legs because they're both tetrapods from a phylogenetic point of view. Okay, so here we go. I've got reptiles and mammals. And this is Huge, of course, but I'm going to try to go through it. I'll probably need about 15, 20 minutes on Wednesday. Then the rest of the time will be with you. So these first two are big. This is the first group now that are going to be fully terrestrial. So even though you can consider amphibians to be partially terrestrial, their reproductive life history is still tied to water. So they're not fully terrestrial. These guys, you'll see, have a very special kind of an egg called an amniotic egg. We refer to this group of reptiles, birds, and mammals as amniotes. And you might go, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, mammals don't lay eggs. Well, of course, some do, right? Like, probably the platypus lays eggs, right? And the kidna lays eggs. So there are a few that do. And you realize that all mammals have a very derived version of an amniotic egg, right? So you'll see that the amniotic egg has four internal membranes. It has this amnium that goes around the baby and is fluid filled, right? It has this allantois that's used as a waste sac. It has a little yolk sac that's the food supply. It has this corian that lines the shell, right? So let's think about, we've got a pregnant woman. You're going to say, wow, a pregnant woman shouldn't have an egg. It's crazy. Or does she? So the amnion is there, right? When a, water, when a woman's water breaks, that's the amnion breaking, right? And the amniotic fluid coming out. So an amnion around the baby, that's definitely there, just as if you had a chicken egg. You open a chicken egg, it's the same thing. There's an amnion around the chicken, right? How about the allantois and the yolk sac? In most mammals, those membranes have been modified to form a structure called 
the placenta, which connects to the baby, to its umbilical cord, right? The placenta, you realize, is part of the baby, not part of the mother. A woman who's not pregnant doesn't have a placenta. She has a uterus, right? The placenta attaches to the uterine wall. But what happens to the placenta when the baby's born? It detaches and comes out. That's the afterbirth, right? You realize the amnion, the placenta, that's all basically homologous to the internal membrane system that you find in a chicken egg. A pregnant woman basically does have a chicken egg inside of her. There's just no shell. We're very much amniotes. It's exactly the same system. It's exactly the same internal system. It's just you've lost a shell, and then you've kept it inside of the mother's body rather than having the egg produced outside. Yeah. All amniotes have internal fertilization. There's nobody letting sperm go here. This is very analogous to what seed plants do, is that they don't ever let sperm go, right? Instead, they pass it through a little tube so it goes right to where it needs to go, no releasing it into the environment. No, even, even animals that are amniotes that live their entire lives in water, like dolphins. Dolphins don't like decide they're going to just spew out eggs and sperm into the ocean. You realize that, right? Dolphins have a penis. And they mate, right? And the sperm is put physically inside of the female's body, right? Everybody in this group has internal fertilization. Everybody has this land type of egg. And like I said, the ones that actually lay eggs, like sea turtles and sea snakes, they still bring the eggs and lay them on land. They would never lay those eggs in water. This is really, we've made a major leap here into full terrestrial of vertebrates in this group. There are many ectothermic members, meaning that they are, don't regulate a high internal body temperature constantly, but then there also are endothermic members. The only extant endotherms are birds and mammals, right? Uh, there are many with three-chambered hearts, like snakes, lizards, turtles, right? But there are four-chambered heart members within reptiles. Crocodiles and alligators and birds all have four-chambered hearts. Birds, you realize, are reptiles. Keratin. There's a protein that makes up the scales of a snake. You realize snake scales have nothing to do with like fish scales. Fish scales are bony scales. Snakes have scales that are made out of keratin. Guess what else is made out of keratin? Your hair, your outer skin, your fingernails, right? The feathers on a bird, right? That waterproofing keratin protein on the outside, that's a uniquely amniote feature. You don't find this in amphibians. You don't find this in, in fish, right? And then we're going to talk a little bit about this idea of temporal fenestry. There are these holes in the skull that the master muscles pass through. You'll see that reptiles, with the exceptions of turtles, have two temporal fenestries. So we say that they are diapsids. You'll see that mammals are synapsids. You have only, you have only one hole in your head. Birds and reptiles have two holes in their head. Um, and I'm afraid to click the slide because it's 7 or 6.50, and I'm afraid the next slide is a question, although I don't think it is, but it might be. Let's just see. Hopefully it's not a question. Good. It's a picture of an amniotic egg. So I'll start here. So the lab is huge because it's all stones. So I've got all the kind 